When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 157 of the Life Nerds Podcast. I'm your host, David Ian Howe. I'm joined by my co-host, Connor Johnnan, and also Dr. Carlton Shield Chief Gover. We are all back. There's a button that says, I'm back. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Set it up. I'm back. <laughs> There we go. Okay. <laughs> Childish. We just lost half the listeners right there. Anyway, Carlton is in the Dominican Republic currently, or as I like to call it, Puerto Rico. That was quoting Donald Trump. Anyway, and before we introduce Carlton, I'm going to say, Connor, do you have an addendum to last week's episode? Yeah, we kind of we kind of fucked up. We fucked up the, the, the order of the national register eligibility thank you for all those people who told us to that we were wrong and dumb we really appreciate that stuff so read the bulletin don't listen to us don't send that episode to your friends unless they want to quote things incorrectly but we were incorrect thank you for telling us we were dumb please do, do that every time answers? that happens what's up do you know what the correct answers are no i can't off the top of my head either <laughs> actually we pulled up in slack chris bear with me a second you even sent it to us, so I know you're going to shit yourself if we, <laughs> we don't do it. It's <laughs> rightfully so. I, I would also shit myself if I had just sent this to somebody and they still didn't know it. You're a good man. Okay. Okay. So, uh, National Register criteria. A is action, events. B is body, people, important, etc. C is craftsmanship. And then D is data. So... Those, the site that's has your, all that. Yeah. 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 So that, those are your easy thing. Action, body, craftsmanship, data. Remember that. A, B, C, D. Yes, sir. All right. Carlton, Dr. Sh- Car- oh, excuse me. Newly defended actual Dr. Carlton Shield Chief Gover Esquire Extraordinaire. How you doing? I'm fucking tired. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's how I am. I'm fucking exhausted. It has been a long 10 days and uh, I still have a week more. Yeah. It's a good time, but it's, it's a, it's a lot of work. It is way more work than I thought it was going to be. Like data wise, like mentally wise or physically wise. It's like all of that. I mean, when ultimately we're maybe getting in about like two and a half hours worth of actual data collection field work a, a day. Right. Cause we're doing like two tank dives. And depending on your air consumption, you can be down there anywhere from like uh, 45 minutes to an hour, depending on depth. So the shallower you are, the more air you're going to be able to have. Whereas the deeper you are, the more oxygen you absorb because Mm -hmm. uh, under pressure, oxygen compresses. However, like the whole, this field school is nuts for, for a number of reasons. One, it's the Indiana University Underwater Science Field School. It's an interdisciplinary project that has archaeologists, marine biologists, earth and atmospheric scientists, and animal behaviorists. So there's like anywhere from like three to four teams in the water doing different shit at the same site. And like, so for the archaeology, right now we're doing impact assessments for the Dominican government. So we're going to these sites, these living museums in the sea and monitoring if objects are being displaced or what the fuck's happening. And it's kind of like part of it's a shit show. First day we got out there, these living museums are supposed to have these historic marker buoys. They're supposed to have safety buoys that keep oncoming traffic the fuck away from the site. So you're not killing scuba divers gone. No one knows where they are. The resort's not putting them up. The Dominican government's not putting them back up. So we had to spend like one day just doing site maintenance to, to make sure that we were safe. Um, Because some of those boats are scooting in on top of our divers. Not okay in the slightest. Yikes. But it's like the the daily process is breakfast starts at 7. You have 30 minutes to eat. Then we have morning meeting where we go over what the fuck we're supposed to do. Because like every day. Yeah. It's it's a new thing based on what happened yesterday. 
We load up in the, we take all of our equipment and we put it in the trucks, take the trucks down to scuba fun. Then we load up all the fucking oxygen tanks. So there's about 21 of us. So that means 42 tanks. Load those up into vans, including all of our dive equipment, all of the water. Get that on the fucking boat. Everything's on the fucking boat. Then we got to drive to the site and it depends on where the fuck we're going. And then while, the, while, while that's going on, we're all trying to get ready, putting on our wetsuits, getting over all of our equipment set up. Then we got to send divers in the water, um, our master divers to basically get the right uh, mooring set up. So we have the right guideline to get us onto site. Because <laughs> day one, gentlemen, let me tell you about the shit show the Guadalupe Archaeological Preserve was. Visibility, <laughs> about four feet. <laughs> like it, was, it was turbulent down there. So it's about 25 feet down. You can't see shit. We were all wandering. Like we all burnt through the first tank because no one could find the fucking site. And we, done, we dropped it right next to it. We all scattered. Couldn't find it. And of course, like you're panicking and you don't realize like how fast you're going through oxygen or what's going on. In a normal situation, what you should do if you can't find the site after five minutes, come up, talk to the boat, right? And the boat will direct you. Mm -hmm. Nobody did that. Everyone went through all their oxygen and they just popped up where they ran out of oxygen, right? And so there are people fucking all over the ocean and they have to swim back to the boat. And our dive master, our project director is like, what the fuck is going on? Like he's, he's like Marcel Kornfeld. Like it's a very similar vibe. And except like just, when all of the students are on the ground digging in dirt, they're all floating astray in the fucking flicks of the ocean. <laughs> of course he's going to be upset. <laughs> and so but they were able to find the site. So the second dive, we were able to get down there and actually like do some assessments for the archaeologists for this, for this first half, which I'll get to in a bit. We're just basically like doing, uh, looking at anchors and cannons making sure that they're oriented the right way and then what their inclination is because we're trying to see what the fuck's happening. And what is what is happening is because these mooring buoys keep getting lost or cut by somebody, people are tying their mooring lines to the fucking cannons. So then the cannons the are going to the sea, <laughs> throw <laughs> around the sea floor <laughs> because these boats are just pulling them and it's destroying coral. So like it, that's that's where this interdisciplinary nature is coming in. It's like one, there's some very endangered corals that love the iron on these things. We're watching those. Then we have the marine biologists watching these sergeant major fish that make their nests on straight walls. So they're putting their and these things will fucking attack you. I'm trying to get like this inclination where I have this fish like literally biting my face and like coming after me. And the fucker's only this big, like, but they're aggressive. And then you just gotta watch out. Like we have a lot of eels. Uh, at, at the site and then these lionfish that are invasive and they're extremely venomous there's no sharks in this part of the dr like um we're in the southeast tip we're in the caribbean but as i'll talk about later uh the rest of the project we're going to be on the atlantic site and there there be sharks which are fine but uh but we've kind of gone to a number of sites so like we did the guadalupe called the guap archaeological reserve that's right off the coast here where i'm at now at, at viva we did the Captain Kidd site the second day, which was a blast. So what happened was, is when Captain Kidd found out that he had been, he's, he's not really a pirate. He's a, uh, a privateer. But when he found out he was being accused of piracy, he was basically like, he's the only pirate that is known to have ever buried treasure, like offloaded his treasure, set his ship on fire. And he went to New England where he was eventually hung twice. And the Captain Kidd is a phenomenal site for two reasons. One, treasure hunters couldn't find it because they looked at the documents. They knew where the ship was burnt and they thought it fell there. But our uh, project lead, Charlie, Professor Charlie Beaker, he went to England, looked at documents, and there's a, uh, there was a Dutch narrative that watched the burning ship basically leave this river tributary and float to Catalina Island, and that's where it sunk. So we were able to find it a couple of years ago. And so it's completely preserved. Treasure hunters haven't hit it. And that's pretty critical in this country where there's not a single archaeology program, a single museum creation program. There's only a handful of archaeologists, most of which are Cuban. So all the cultural material that has come out of the ocean in this country is through treasure hunters. And through these treasure hunter agreements, they're 50-50 splits between the treasure hunters and the Dominican government. So Oof. there is like I, I've looked at site plans by these treasure hunters. They're fucking garbage. They're destroying coral. Like their job, <laughs> like all they're focused on is getting things out to sell. But Captain Kidd wasn't that way. I wasn't able to do as much work at Kidd because while I'm here also being a professor and helping these 
like run things. I'm also trying to get my scientific diving certificate. So the Captain Kidd site has this wall that goes down 100 feet. So that's where I did my deep dive. So while everyone else is kind of doing that, I got to go go down this fucking sheer face coral 100 feet down in this crystal clear water where I could see the top. It, it was easily the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. I was only down there like t- the whole dive itself was 20 minutes and our bottom time was five at the depth. But there was this gorgeous, very rare corals that are extraordinarily expensive down there um, that I got to see. And then it kind of came up and then that was a one tank dive. So it was a 20 mile boat ride. So it was like an hour and a half to get there. And so what I did, I had, so we had, and the, the site's precarious because it's, it's the current is hitting it up against the reef. There aren't many beaches here. Like this environment, the Dominican Republic is very similar to the Yucatan. It's a karst environment, lots of limestone, not natural beaches. So we had like two students like on the reef ledge, they have walkie talkies trying to direct students in this really choppy water. Like we were coming up because after a hundred feet, you have to do a safety stop at around 15 feet, me and my dive buddy who led me, we just kind of went and checked out the cannons and their safety stop, just kind of serving their archaeology. But like that, the current was so, was bad. And you had to be very careful because students were getting slammed into reefs, slammed into corals. Like then it, it was, it was precarious. It's dangerous, Oof. but it was gorgeous, gorgeous there. So once I took my stuff off, I was just helping students direct because our main project there were these palmata corals that students were trying to find and do photogrammetry. So what we did at Captain Kidd mostly is we photogrammetry the entire site to develop a, a GIS model to see where everything is. Because that's that's the best way you can get any information out of underwater arc. You can't really take measurements. So you have to just do photogrammetry and just fucking map an entire site. And and that's, that's how you're going to find your artifact distributions and look at differences in how things have changed relatively. It's, it's a really different world. And, you're, and you have to think very differently about these things. And it's not like at a field school or an active project where you come into something you don't know, you can just tell you like, hey, what's going on? And you can track from there. It's like, you can't talk underwater. And you have a limited time that you're there. And so like you are trying to, it is just high speed all the time. And we knew we weren't going back to Kit. And that was the only day we were there. So you're really given like the small window to, to do all this stuff. And like you mentioned at our previous episode, which I think was like 150, 151, you said that like the, even in like the pools, the communication is terrible and you're trying to orient yourself just ex- exponentially worse in that real life. Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I've gotten really comfortable where I don't know anything. I will, if like if something's happening, I'm, I'm not wasting oxygen. We're going up to the surface. I'm going to communicate with the boat. And we're going to go back down because I've heard enough of our project director being like, why won't students just come up and let's figure this out? Because they start kind of freaking out down below and trying to figure it out themselves. I'm like, fuck that. I don't know what's going on here. I'm going up to get this man that's been doing this since the fucking 70s. He'll tell me what to do and get down there and, and move forward. So I have no problem asking for help. To just go up? No, not at all. Because um, okay. some of these places, like we're not going below 30 feet, really, where there's these mandatory safety stops, especially like the guap that's like maybe 15 to 20 feet. I can just pop up real quick. You deflate your BCD, you come up, I just signal to the boat, I'll just kick over. And then, yeah, there's a little bit of oxygen consumption on the way to get uh, my trim back in line. So once I get back under the water, I need to balance myself to make sure I'm not going up or down too much. What's so there's also a lot of oxygen manage it myself. So like my first couple dives, I was only down there for like 30 minutes because I was not accustomed to that kind of work. But like now I'm able to get a dive down for an hour because I'm like, I have to actively think about my breathing all the time. Like I have a little note on my data slate that's like, like slow, deep breaths. And that's also helped me maintain my buoyancy a lot better uh, underwater. So I'm able to hover a lot easier now and get that work done. You said obesity? Oh, a BCD. That's the like vest you wear that has your scuba tank attached to it. It has your regulators. It has your dive computers at times. And you, you said to, to deflate it, does it like suck water in? So, yeah. So this is what Jacques Cousteau invented, this whole scuba system. So it will actually inflate and deflate with air. So hmm. to help manage your buoyancy. And then also when you're at the surface, you can just inflate it and it basically acts like a life vest. So you can just sit there and just fucking backstroke your way to the boat without much effort. So it'll keep you up. So usually when you jump into the water, when you first go in, your obesity is a little inflated. So that way when you hit the water, you'll just come up or else because you just don't want to sink. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that takes oxygen out of your actual tank, and that's how it's connected. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's little air arrows that's connected directly to it. Yeah. You want to use that like sparingly if possible, right? Because you want to preserve the oxygen and get as much time below as possible. Yeah. And there's also like a manual inflate thing. So like rather I'm getting better at not having to use the buttons that will take the oxygen directly in. Since I'm already breathing oxygen, I'm, I'm getting better at just like manually inflating it so I don't have to drain too much. Because at this point now, I think I have over 450 minutes underwater at this point through this project. So I've gotten like much better. And like a lot of the students, it's kind of been funny because they're like, he has the highest amount of archaeological training, but the least amount of being underwater. So like a lot of the students are help, were helping me to like figure my shit out while I'm trying to like, I'm sitting there like floating around, like trying to tell them how to take measurements. And, you know, like, and it was hard for me, like fucking turning upside down on accident. Like just the way the air will, will fit in a vest that, um, you know, because I mean, you know how air, air, air works that way. So like a lot of times we're angled, so our heads are down, so our fins aren't kicking up sediment in the back. So all that oxygen in the, is in your back. And then when you try to like orient yourself or you move in a certain way, those oxygen bubbles will move in your vest and you're like, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> Do you use a, like a, a Trimble to map, like to get a datum or do you drop it down from a boat? Or like, or is it just an arbitrary around the site? Arbitrary around the site. So like, you can't really get good GPS coordinates. We had a student the other day. He, he uh, got an app on his phone and got like one of those waterproof protectors, and he was just snorkeling above and like trying to get data. But the other issue is, is like the way the water refractions work. Distances are a little fucky wucky, and then just trying to get like a straight line in a current is just difficult. So that's why we do the photogrammetry. And since we're pretty close to shore, you can map those onto Google Maps and GIS coral plots. So like NOAA has done a lot of reef and shoreline data. So we're able to map it that way. And you have like known tie points, right? Or like known locations that you can, yeah. you can, you can ultimately tie it all together. Yeah. And so like all the sites that we work at, the purpose of this project is these living museums at the sea. So these are protected sites. And that, what that introduces then to the local tourist economies, they also become these scuba zones. So like all across by eBay, there's Indiana University pamphlets of all the living museums and they're actively like dive the five dive shops in town are like, we're going to go check out this living museum done by the Americans and see these cannons. Like there's fucking plaques down there that have like the name of the ship and everything like that. And when it sank and it's all in Spanish, I can't fucking read it. <laughs> but like they're, they're just, you know, but it's not just like this random collection of cannons that we're the ones that know about it. We're, we're actively making these living parks to save them one from the treasure hunters, but two to stimulate local economy and interest into these locations. Well, on that note, let's hop into the next segment. Or, Bye-bye. Sponsors. I think we have Patriot supply.com now. Let's, let's hear that. Let's hear that ad. Stock up on everyday essentials at Menards and save big money. We're your one-stop shop for pet food and supplies. Blue Buffalo Dog and Cat Food is made with real meat and natural ingredients that your pets will love. Save big on Blue Buffalo Pet Food at Menards, America's number one home improvement retailer for customer satisfaction, according to J.D. Power. Visit JDPower.com for details and Menards.com for deals. Save big money at Menards. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Welcome back to episode 157 of Life in Ruins podcast. I'm here with Carlton and Connor. We're reminiscing about Carlton's, or Carlton's reminiscing, not even reminiscing. He's telling us the active play-by-play of what's going on at his school. But in the interim, we were talking about Carlton's like fascination with where he's at now and that he might possibly want to just become a sea person. But we were talking about the Taino. Can you can you tell us about the Taino? I've, I've met a Taino. Yeah. What's really attracted me to this project is, as I mentioned in the first segment, like just the general lack of archaeology that's being conducted here. And the second is really how the Caribbean is really the American Mediterranean. And that there's a lot of interaction going on between like the American Southeast. Like, I, I like that phrase. That's a cool way to put it. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of interaction between the American Southeast, Central America, particularly the Maya, and then also like 
northern South America. They are all contributing into this melting pot of culture and trade in the Caribbean, centering from like the Bahamas, the Keys, down to the uh, Lesser Antilles and the Greater Antilles, and the Greater Antilles being Cuba, uh, Dominican, Haiti, and, and, and so forth, and Puerto Rico. And so there's like this really interesting influx of, of cultures and traditions, but the Taino are so poorly understood, and this is this catch-all term for indigenous people to the Caribbean that were all but annihilated by the Spanish. And so I got to do a cave dive a couple days ago where we went to one of these freshwater, basically a cenote. And the cenote itself used to be a dry cave. And we know that through the presence of stalagmites and stalactites, which only form in a dry cave environment in which water is trickling down, leaving the um, calcium carbonate behind and creating those, you know, jaws of a cave. And it's completely flooded. But what's in there? There's fucking hearths in there. There's Taino pottery in there. There's fucking dead sloths in there. And so you're able to go around this like Uncle Fungi. really frozen period of time that's was just incredible. There's like cave art and rock art that is present both in um, through ochre, red paint, as well as pictographs and pictograms. And you know, the Taino, there's a lot of early documentation of the Taino with, with the Spanish. And so the majority of Taino culture history is just through ceramics. And so that's just kind of been the focus or these really, you know, old school typologies. And that's how people have thought about replacement in, in, in the Caribbean. And I've been reading up on the literature and that's changing where it's like, no, pots aren't fucking people. But it's like, this is another one of those geographic localities that suffers from a, a a huge lack of archaeologists and also one of the larger islands which had Taino, you know, is fucking blockaded still embargoed. And they don't like to talk to the Americans very much. So there's this like general lack of data transference. And so that's what's kind of got me is not only like looking at the Taino history, this really the first people interacted with Western Europeans, but then also there is this cultural reawakening of Taino across the Caribbean where more people are like reconnecting and with their Taino identity and that their actual Taino remnant populations like in the mountains. So like the tallest mountain east of the Mississippi is actually here in the Dominican Republic. And so like there are these massive mountain ranges here in the country that have preserved Taino people and like ways of life that are, they're still rather hesitant. In North America? No, east of the Mississippi. Like even in South America? They're, oh, East of, oh, sorry, I see, I see. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So like the mountain ranges here are part of the Appalachians, the Appalachian formation, if that makes sense. Yeah. So as you're, as you're diving into this stuff, are you finding that this catch-all term, or I guess at the time of contact, were all these groups kind of homogenous and all these different islands? Or is the, the Taino just a catch-all term to describe indigenous Car- Caribbean cultures without recognizing kind of the individuality of the each separate kind of location? Yeah, so it's definitely the latter. Even here on Hispaniola, we know that there's at least four major groups, but we really don't know the boundaries between these groups or what the difference is. A lot of it's once again based on the pottery, but there's just you know just don't know. Like the the Spanish systematically wiped out these people, especially here in the, in the DR in Haiti. Yeah, like they wanted them gone because they weren't playing ball. Puerto Rico, there's more known about Puerto Rican Taino than kind of the rest of them, but like a lot of people here in, in the DR in Haiti, right? It, they're mostly, they look at their cultural roots primarily. In, in Haiti, it's going to be more African, the enslaved ancestry. And then the DR, they really kind of push that Spanish background. So there is like a really stark difference between the Haitian and Dominican populations. And a lot of that deals with the colonial roots and the countries being set up. You know, like the independence day of the Dominican Republic isn't the day they got independence from Spain, but when they got independence from Haiti. Hmm. That's wild. There's a, a fascinating video a couple months ago. It's about Ancient Americas on YouTube. Great channel. He does really good research. I think he's an archaeologist. But it's a peopling of the Caribbean. And because there's so little evidence of like pot or like anything remaining and the genetics are just literally a melting pot of all the entire world, like even Indian people that live there, like subcontinental Indian people it's hard to tell where the migrations came from. So they're like, did they come from Florida to Cuba and then down? But some of the genetics point to maybe from Brazil and Colombia up to Puerto Rico and then maybe back down. And it's like all over the place. But like, like Carlton saying, everybody that lives in the greater or the lesser Antilles or even Curacao has like, like Spanish DNA, but they have everything else. So they they don't know. And like, I know a lot of Puerto Rico 
friends in New York that say like I'm Taino, but I'm like you're, you know, I I can't tell them like you look European to me, but yeah, you're like yeah. So the main narrative is that people came up the Lesser Antilles through South America first, and then there's like a Western wave coming in from the Maya, and there's like a lot of iconographic and ceremonial similarity between the Spanish contact Taino and the Maya, like they, the cenotes and like a lot of those things are pretty prevalent. And there's not much evidence for interaction or peopling from South America or from the Southern United States, like Florida. I just don't buy that. And people say, well, you know, uh, people only lived in the Caribbean for the past 5,000 years. I'm like, that's bullshit. Like people got to possibly Monte Verde, but we know people had watercraft to get to the fucking Western coasts. You're telling me they just like burnt their boats on land and forgot how to build boats to get to, especially at the end of the Pleistocene, where the water levels were lower. Like you can fucking damn near see Cuba from Yucatan. So I don't, I don't buy that. Like the, it's, you it's think they incredible. They got to Veracruz and burnt their boats there. Possibly, yes. But I think people have been here much longer. Just the environment here is so tropical and acidic. And there's also not much of a stone tool industry, but I'm not sure if it's because people aren't looking for it. Because there are like these, the cores of these islands are, are metamorphic by nature. They're volcanic. So mm-hmm. there are those good stone tool materials present in the interiors. Now, the, you know, the outlying parts of these islands are these limestone Pleistocene corals. Yeah, it just seems like, I mean, if you can see the Bahamas from Florida, I feel like you could island hop and see islands the whole way down to anywhere in the Antilles. Like, exactly. It, it, it doesn't seem like it's a stretch to say that people have been there for a long time. Like you said, I mean, if they're if they don't understand like kind of the, um, the indigenous culture, how are they going to understand, let alone the, the prehistoric 10,000 year old kind of stuff on air? New South, the company I used to work for in Georgia got like super lucky and got a contract to dig a ball court in Puerto Rico. That blew my mind. I was talking to my boss about it too, who like went down there and like, there's just so much Mayan and like Yucatan influence in there. Like not that the Mayans were colonizing that area, but like that ball court culture and like that kind of just like it spread across the Caribbean. Apparently there's ball courts all over the Caribbean, which is. So there are three ball courts within a five mile radius of where I am right now. Like they're all over the Dominican and Haiti doing the same kind of hit ball game that the Mayans were doing at at the time of European contact. So there's definitely, I think there's heavy influence coming in from Central America here in the Greater Antilles. I just don't know about the Lesser Antilles or what's going on in the Bahamas and those outlying islands to the Northeast that are closer to Florida. But it's, it, it is literally the American Mediterranean here. So it is the, you know, the fucking Mississippi River Delta ends up just north and you have a major river delta in Venezuela entering out and then you have Yucatan. Like people are getting here and there's trade goods coming in all the way from fucking Montana and the Great Lakes as well as from the fucking Andes. So definitely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It only makes sense that they were all like they were they were boat folks and, and moving around and interacting i mean i think that <laughs> that only makes sense and, and influencing each other and interacting as different cultures and and whatnot but i mean that i think that would be really cool to kind of trace that interaction and see how it, it goes but it seems like if they don't have an archaeologist on the island or you know or anywhere else in there it's it's hard to make those connections and really study it yeah well that and then you also have the treasure hunters which are actually a huge problem here like the day before we were supposed to leave here the treasure hunter sent a letter to Indiana University claiming that what we were doing was in violation of a bunch of shit that we were acting without university approval. But then rather having the treasure hunter prove his bullshit, we had to prove he was lying, which was because he had no proof. And like they're, we're, you know, we're taking these sites away from them to create protective parks and they're not happy about it. And like the, the, the ministry of culture wants to work with archaeologists to protect their resources because what they see with with iu we're taking a bunch of materials with us back to indiana conserving them getting them ready and then bringing them back to the dr so they're still getting rather than this 50 50 split they're used to they're getting the 100 percent now granted some then end up walking out later down the road but you know the treasure hunters aren't getting a cut um, so it's like a really weird environment to do this kind of work because it's not just like the random Art of like pot or um, arrowhead hunters, like it is like these very large and financially backed institutions that were fundamentally getting you know you know cutting their bottom line away from them. So they made a deal with the the treasure hunters, like traders. What do you mean? 
Yeah, yeah. They, he said earlier that they like they they do like a fifty fifty split where you know they'll make these co- contracts with these guys and and give them half the stuff and the government gets half the stuff and the money. So it's like Sounds it's an like embedded part of this. Ganja Club. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's not great. So it's been interesting to navigate this environment because I'm like, what the fuck? And I hear these stories of like at conferences, treasure hunters like approaching our members of my team or other dark algae teams from um, the Carolinas, like trying to start fist fights over it because they're like, you're, you know, we're taking away their profession, but they're, yeah. they're just after the shit. They're just after the artifacts. Whereas we're also not only just yeah. preserving these artifacts, but also protecting marine ecosystems. It wouldn't surprise me if those are um, connected into larger black markets too. So like you really could be starting to mess with like mobs, gangs. Yeah. As you get like really deeper into this stuff, like if you start cutting the bottom line, you know, it seems a little dangerous. There's a lot of the same families here in the Caribbean that are in some of the larger East coast crime syndicates. No, a lot of Italians. I saw a thing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i mean they were the first to sail there i guess i saw when the spanish were especially when they were pulling stuff out of uh Cerro de Pazzi in in argentina one ship that went back to spain like occasionally had is enough money to pay for the entire coffers of the like kingdom of england for an entire year which is why the queen was like francis drake go get that money like go sink those ships so all of that money, like Spain was just extorting the fuck out of the new world and taking all that gold back and silver. So like in our country, we don't really have a lot of that. So like, it's just like Clovis points are on the black market. I'm hopefully not human bones. I'm sure they are. But like in the Caribbean, it's like pretty clear just from like knowing only superficially about it. When you're treasure hunting, it's like pounds of like silver and doubloons and things like that, which I'm sure has all been picked clean from the immediate ones you can see, but Carlton, I don't know. Do you know a lot about that from school? Yeah. I mean, like I showed you guys that picture of the fucking yeah. <laughs> brick of concreted Spanish silver. And so there's a lot of it that, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that people are looking for the shipwrecks. And so like the one that we're working on next week, so the students go home tomorrow and then the staff are staying. So it's going to be much more team. We're going to do like actually much more active excavations at this mid fifth, 16th century shipwreck. And that's where we found, oh, I have them right here. I keep getting my room wet. You know, we pulled out fucking 50 horseshoes the other day. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I just going to pull out an artifact. Carlton not only bent over to pull up an artifact, but it was dripping wet. <laughs> Yeah, no, well, I have a, I have what a, the fuck? I have a I have a uh, Gatorade cooler in here full of salt water that I have a, a shitload of horseshoes in. Um, <laughs> so, like, horse it, massacre. Just, when this also ties into like the horse and human society shit, I'm also down here looking for you know the earliest horses that got to um, the Americas, and it's it's hard. But we don't know the name of the ship. Uh, treasure hunters got to it. They don't know the name of it, but we know it's a mid 15th century ship um, based on some typology. So it had cast iron bombard cannons. So they weren't, or not cast iron, sorry, rod iron. So those are early caravels. They didn't know how to cast iron. They're firing fucking granite cannonballs. The whole thing is Wait, nuts. mid 15th century being like 1400s? Sorry, mid 16th century. Okay. So mid 15th, 1500s. So it's an early ship, not quite the galleons yet. But we don't know the name of the ship. There's a couple, like a lot of ships went down here, like a lot. It, 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 it's not just like reading a book, trying to figure out like, okay, what ship is this? But we just know generally this ship is from the mid 1500s. We don't know which one, but we do know like they they wrecked by hitting a coral reef. Then you can see that they try to drop both of their anchors and then they also try to drop their holy shit third anchor to really stop them. And, and they didn't, they hit the reef. Oh, and, shit. You know, a, a fucking ship carried 17 anchors at any given time. Like there was a rule in the Spanish government, like you had to have 17 anchors on your ship. Or um, breaks? Well, a lot of them were kept in the at the bottom as ballast. Oh, okay. But then, yeah, you also just needed extra anchors in case shit happened, right? So we know the treasure hunters, they left their fucking stakes there, but we don't think they hit the entire site. So next week, what we're doing, well, tomorrow and in the next couple of days is we're going to go start excavating, like actual excavations outside of where we know based on how these ships are oriented. We know where the anchors are. We know where the ballast uh, stones and the anchors are, but there's a, a 
aft half of the ship that hasn't been found. So that's what we're going to try to figure out. And that might have the bell on it, which will have the name of the ship and maybe some of the more like actual, we, we can tell what the, what this thing was fucking carrying, but they were carrying a lot of fucking horseshoes. I'll tell you that. Like that's something that we find. So did they have horses? We don't know, but that's wild. Um, I'm going to drop all 17 anchors on this segment and uh, <laughs> us right here. So we'll be right back. Hey, archaeology podcast fans. Anyone that's heard me on a show has likely heard me mention coffee one or probably a thousand times. Coffee, however awesome it is, has some downsides and should be consumed in moderation. That's why we partnered with Laird Superfoods. They've got lots of stuff, but their coffee and coffee creamers have been engineered to taste better, provide functional benefits, and don't contain any refined sugars. So are you ready to feel more energized, focused, and supported? Go to LairdSuperfood.com and add nourishing plant-based foods to fuel you from sunrise to sunset. Use our promo code ARCPODNETFEED at checkout and save 15% on your purchase today. You can also click the link in your show notes. Hey, podcast fans, I've got to talk to you about drinking water. As an archaeologist, I've been on surveys where we had to drink three to five liters of water every day. That's 1.3 gallons just to basically not die. Sometimes that water just doesn't hydrate you as quickly as you're using it. That's why we've partnered with Liquid IV. The small packets make it easy to take one with you to work, to work out or on any adventure. I like the strawberry lemonade and lemon lime ones the best. Just put one stick of liquid IV into 16 ounces of water and get hydrated two times faster than with just water alone. And now with our partnership, you can get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code ARCPODNETFEED at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration Today using promo code ARCPODNETFEED at liquidiv.com. 157, David, Carlton, Connor, Life in Ruins. We're here. We're now. Yeah. But other than the scientific dives we had, we've had done a couple fun things. We did site maintenance, which we talked about of repairing all the buoys and making the dive area safe because they're just gone and they're not being kept up. But we did a night dive last night for the bio folks. They want to see these corals spawn. So, I mean, we all just went in with flashlights, but like we got in there before the sun went down. So you're just like in the water as it just turns pitch black and we have flashlights. And it was like some of the coolest shit, like the, the whole ocean floor changed. So like all the, the eels were out. There was crabs fucking all Whoa. the corals were fully out like <laughs> doing their fucking. thing. <laughs> They like watched a moray eel fucking get a fish and like wrap around it. I was like, holy shit. No, it was just incredible. And then there's a lot of bioluminescence. So if you stir up the stand, like all these blue glows happen. So that's just been incredible. Did you almost get attacked by a manta ray? An eagle ray. Yes. That was a couple of days ago. And I had missed it because like on that day during the site maintenance, I was just, I was lionfish hunting because lionfish are invasive and they're all over the site. So I just took a spear gun and I was fucking slaying lionfish left and right. I was having a blast because they don't move. And then we had this special tube in them because they're still venomous that we put them in. I ended up with like a decent amount of lionfish. But when you're down in the first dive, my buddy Keegan, dive buddy Keegan, was like, did you see that eagle ray that went right behind us? Because like there's this reef wall that we're at and that's where the lionfish are. So behind us is just open ocean. I missed it. But then on the second dive, as we're going through the reef, all of a sudden, it got like really hard to see. Like there's a lot of sediment built up and I thought someone might have just like kicked the ocean floor. But it was like really weird. Like I couldn't figure it out because I couldn't see any, anybody around. And as I'm, as I'm swimming over the disturbed sediment, like I'm pretty close to the floor, I see this tail start moving up towards me and it has this fucking steve Irwin annihilator just pointed at my chest and i was like, Hold, I like it was at this moment that he knew he fucked up <laughs> yes <laughs> i immediately kicked up inflated my bcd a bit to get me out of the way and then once i was able to clear i could see this massive like 10 foot wingspan eagle ray that had embedded in the sand to hunt and i had just dumbassedly <laughs> swam right <laughs> over it and it upset it. And I was like, oh, it was like one of the coolest things in my life. And we brought the photographer in. I'm like, take fucking pictures of this. Because it was just incredible. I was like, how massive that thing was. And how close I came to just getting fucking shanked by a stingray. Those things are no, nothing to joke around about, man. Those those stingrays are, you know, they, they took the best of us. R.I.P. Like I've seen skates, like the little dinner plate little fuckers, but I'm like 10 foot wingspan. This thing was massive. I was just super impressed. And every time I go in here to do that archaeological work, you know, we had that conversation with Maddie McAllister way back when of like, when you go into these marine environments, like it's not sharks you have to worry about. It's air consumption. It's your dive buddies. And it's a, a lot of other local organisms that you, you have to be careful about. Like during one of the dives the other night, one of our dive masters had her hand on a coral to kind of 
kind of brace yourself in a surge. A surge is where you kind of get rocked back and forth. So a current will push you one way, but a surge will rock you. Everyone else saw this moray eel that was below her and it started to coil up. And they were able to get her hand out of the way in time because those things have two sets of teeth. So the main jaw, the pharyngeal jaw, all their teeth point backwards and they're fucking nasty like Komodo dragons where their mouths are just have so much shit in them that um, they'll fuck you up pretty good. There's a guy who was part of this team. Like last year, he got his hand fucked up. It severed his artery. And they had, tourn- they, had a, they had a tourniquet underwater. And I don't know what they were doing where they had they came prepared with fucking tourniquets. I don't have a tourniquet anywhere on my equipment. Do you guys bring a first aid kit down with you? We have one on the boat. In order to get dive master, you have to be underwater rescue certified. So we have like eight people at any given time who know what the fuck's going on when it comes to health and safety of the site. Gotcha. Of, of the people. So, yeah, it's it's intense. And then always monitoring water. That's always like I'm chugging water all the time when I'm on the boat. It's like counterintuitive like because like so you're, you're in salt water, so you're getting dehydrated constantly. But, you know, you you think like, oh, I don't have to drink water or anything like that. But dehydration is a very real thing, it seems like, as as part of. How do you pee if you're drinking that much water? So that's why I don't tuck my wetsuit into my boots. So I don't fill up my boots with piss. I just piss in the ocean. And then when I'm getting off, when I'm getting off the boat, we're getting back on the boat. I kind of like unzip my wetsuit in the back, pretty preparedly to try to get all that stuff out. But I'm not in a dry suit; I'm in a wetsuit. But like that was one of the first tips. Like one of the students here, Jenna, she's like, "Don't tuck your wetsuit into your boots, or else you're just going to fill your boots with piss." We got boots full you know? of piss. <laughs> you know, so it's it's one of those things, and like I had to learn. Especially, I was eating breakfast really heavily here, and I learned that was a no-no because I was just getting bloated. Because you know we're at this all-inclusive place where you you know have all this food, and so like I had to start especially getting dehydrated, getting a loose stool. So I've just been eating fucking raisin bran every morning, like bowls of raisin bran. So I don't get bloated, I don't get more oxygen, and like I'm not potentially letting out you know shitting my wetsuit. <laughs> that's, that's important. You did so. You mentioned something. Mentioned something in the the inner room in the green room. Are all three of us and Jacob Arns and shout out uh, play this game called Sea of Thieves? Like at an addict's level, I don't think we're at uh, David and Zelda level, but we we play it a lot. And you, <laughs> um, but, but but you did you did lose use some of your um, Sea of Thieves knowledge or. To, to, to save you. Do you, do you mind recounting yeah. that story? Yeah. So we get back, we usually get back around two o'clock so we can make time for lunch. And then we have about two hours off before we need to reconvene, get reports written, do our reports and presentations and figure out the game plan for the next day. And so today, one of the students um, who had taken sailing classes, like there's sailboats here and you can just rent them for like 30 minutes for free. So that's what we did. So I went out with three of the students and we did really well. We were really impressed, but she had kept the wind and the way the wind flow was following the shoreline. So we just kind of zooted away from the resort. And then we had to turn back and got to this dead stop and she didn't know what she was doing. And I was, I was like trying to tell her like, I, I know I don't sail, but I know like we need to take this other angle. It's going to take us away from the resort, but it'll take us for an out to sea that we can then turn the sail again and we can have a better hypotenuse. And we just have to do this kind of, zigzag pattern she wasn't hearing it like she she refused so we get to the dead stop the boat stop we're going over the buoys into the the fucking public swimming area we're getting people yelling at us so i like hop off the boat and i'm turning the boat myself so it can catch sail and go and of course the second i do that the fucking boat just takes off and leaves (laughs) and and, and look and they can't stop it they're letting out the line to have the sail kind of drop and it's just fucking gone and the speedboat comes up to rescue everybody because like we, had, we were beyond time. And he's trying to get me in the boat. I'm like, no, I'm just fucking swimming to shore. Like, I have a life jacket on. I just fucking breaststroke back to shore because like, I'm, I'm done with this adventure. So I waited <laughs> for them. Because like he, when he tied them up, I thought he was going to slowly bring them to shore. No, no, no. They were basically on like a fucking, like one of those um, inflatable tubes. And he just fucking was whipping them. And I heard them <laughs> screaming as they're being yeah. towed on this little catamaran. And it's just going all over the place. I'm like, holy shit. Like, I'm so glad I'm not on that boat with those girls. But I had this, like, the second that boat started, just just took off and I'm just stuck there. It was this moment of, like, that we see in this game where, like, if you fall off the ship, the ship's not stopping. It just has to keep going. And I'm like, I'm fucking left here. And there's no artificial mermaid to take me back, like, spawn me back. <laughs> I'm 
in the middle of the ocean by myself. So I need to like, like this is this is not not fucking fun in games. So I like just swam to shore, and then made it in time for my deep tissue massage at five o'clock, and I would that was out. <laughs> No, it's funny because yeah, the mechanism in the game is like if you fall off the ship, which you do frequently, there's this mermaid that brings you back and, you know, you can always make it. It's not like a death sentence. But like, <laughs> that's the first thing I you think. You fall off the ship quite a bit like Jacob. Yeah. And Shout out Jacob Ardson, our, our boy. So, but all in all, it's been, it's been really interesting. It's really kind of pushed me to think differently about archaeology, especially in the context of, I really like this living museum concept, these like interdisciplinary field schools where you get these different scholars to work together. And I'm like trying to see how you can translate that to a terrestrial context, right? Because we think about Cahokia, Mesa Verde, some of these big sites where like the landscape is managed specifically to promote the beauty of the archaeology whereas yeah. here the cannons are being overtaken by corals and are like actively becoming part of this this underwater environment so i've been like thinking how how do we bring this or develop a, a terrestrial field school that will bring in wildlife biologists and other people to see like how these landscapes these modern day natural landscapes can be protected and help reinforce protections for um, cultural landscapes yeah definitely i mean and especially because all the other sciences in the world are better funded than we are currently. So if you have funding mechanisms and coming from multiple places, it seems like that is the way to go for the future. And yeah. archaeology, terrestrial, terrestrial archaeologists can use um, soil scientists, biologists. I mean, we can we can use a bunch of other disciplines and work with a bunch of other disciplines to really do that. And they can give us money. So that I think that's a great idea. Hopefully we can find a way to work that into uh, your future research uh, when you're diving lakes in nebraska yeah i mean it was i did my defense down here which you guys talked about at the beginning so like i had to defend from this from from fucking dominican republic like during my presentation i did that horseshoe bit with them i was like yeah so like what we're doing down here with continuing this horse research pull and i pulled out a horseshoe and they're like what the fuck are you doing in the caribbean like you're a plans archaeologist like none of us understand what you're doing down there are you distracted like get your fucking head in the game you just got like roasted just to me to do like a fun bit of like here's a fucking horseshoe that's covered in shells like, and they're like fucking stop it was like it, it backfired but will taylor thought it was funny he was like okay he's like we need to talk about the horseshoe later i'm like yeah we do but like everyone else is like you work in nebraska like what the fuck is going on well, it, I think it makes sense. I mean, you, you have to like expand and like get better at archaeology. You can't just like stay in one place and do the same thing over and over again. I mean, that's, you're not going to use new techniques or something if you if you just stay in the same place and do the same shit over and over again. Yeah. And my museum has partnered with some of these Dominican folks that were like t to helping them develop exhibits, curatorial practices. So like I am actually down here doing work. And I'm very fortunate that the underwater scientists and the archaeologists here, Jesus. Also, Carlton's going to get us a grant to come down there and uh, do all this research, too. So he told us um, we're we're committing it to the podcast that he said he's going to do it. <laughs> the amount of my the amount of friends I have now that are like, hey, by the way, I'm scuba certified. I'm like, OK, I bet you are. But no, there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. And there's like so much room that people are actively demanding more and more help. And it's like atrocious that like the underwater archaeology lab in Santo Domingo is in the former prison of uh, the former dictator. Like it's this tiny ass building. There's open tanks outside that have fish in them to keep the mosquitoes down. Like these things just aren't being taken care of because they just don't have the funding and they want help and they're, they're desperate for it. And they're tired of being taken advantage of by treasure hunters and they want to preserve these things. But it's part of a really weird economy where, you know, you have to slick the hands of, uh, you know, even the, the tour guides, because if you're not paying them off to take your their tour guides to the museum. So there's this amazing nautical museum that gets less than 80 people that visit a month. And it's right next to where they drop off tourists. And so it's like trying to figure out a system that promotes and protects cultural heritage in a very much a country that's dominated by tourism. It's difficult. But on that note, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, let me talk about my experience on the podcast. I'm excited to get back next week and get back into recording and talk about some some more stuff that we do. So with that, I'll turn it over to you guys. Well, appreciate it, Carlton. We love you. It's really cool to hear what he's doing because I've never actually met anybody that's done Caribbean. I mean, we met, met, quote, Maddie in Australia, but I mean, that's like a different country. Well, I guess so is the Dominican Republic, but we're, we're pretty much linked to the Caribbean here. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. Well, I think we're all fascinated by it too. I think something it's something that unites us is our love of sailing and kind of like the pirate culture and all those sort of things. I mean, those are some of our best episodes, the ones where we nerd out about that stuff because we all are really super passionate about it and care about it and think it's interesting. So hopefully we'll keep talking about this and keep learning from Carlton as uh, he keeps 
going along and doing this. Thank you all for listening to us. Once again, I'm going to reiterate what we said at the beginning. Check out the NRHP bulletin posted by the National Park Service if you want the real criteria. Don't listen to us. Thank you to all the people who told us that we're dumb. We appreciate you. Thank you for all for listening to the podcast. I think this is the the point where David says that like, rate, review... Guys, just rate and review the podcast. Like, we really need it on on Apple for sure. Donnie, I appreciate you doing so. Think you did. If you listen on Spotify, I remember you're you're a listener. Uh, guys, please rate and review the podcast. It helps us do well. If you listen on Spotify, I'm not sure how to do it, but you can always leave a comment on our Instagram or shoot us a, a well thought out email saying that you can't stand the way Carlton talks. It's fun. Maybe we shouldn't just at that guy out. We'll cut that back out. You guys can send us an email saying, you know, what you like and don't like about the podcast. It'd be great. All right, turn it over. And Connor, would you live a life in underwater ruins? Yes. I might too. Depends on how much air I get. Well, My legs. get to drink beer and speak a lot of Spanish. So I probably would do it. Yeah, that's um, your dream. I mean, yeah, besides. I'm hang out with Mosquito. And then- <laughs> <laughs> Also, we have a Redbubble store, so please go buy stuff. No one's bought anything in 10, in 10 years, so, you know. Redbubble.com slash people slash a Life in Ruins podcast. I think it's just Life in Ruins. Either way, get some stickers. Shoot me a DM if you want stickers. I'll get you some. Or shoot Carlton a DM, I should say. Anyway, Carlton's waiting for us in the green room because he's loaded back in. We will talk to him soon, and bye. <laughs>